Well, PZ, or may I call you PZ? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you and I both have a reputation for being, oh, I don't know, ranting and, and shrill and strident and things. But I think we're both rather sort of gentle, um, oh, yeah. civilized people. No, every, every time I meet people, they, they tell me I'm just a teddy bear. So, yeah, I, yeah. I know exactly what you mean. Um, I, I think there's a difference between... They're, they're confusing personal demeanor with uh, being forthright and out front and being bold about st stating what we believe. Yes. Yeah. I think there's even a sense in which being clear sounds aggressive. There's a certain kind of mind to whom clarity is, if not offensive, kind of threatening. Right, especially if you're talking about religion. Now, religion so, is a yes. very special case yes. because religion has been, become accustomed to being treated as a kind of privileged, uh, favored child who never mm -hmm. gets scolded, never, never has to stand up to the sort of ordinary criticism that any other field like politics does. Or science. Or indeed, or indeed science, <laughs> right. yes. Because in science we have disagreements and we mm -hmm have controversies and we can sometimes get quite passionate about it. Uh, and there's none of this sort of wearing kid gloves, uh, which, religious, which religion seems to expect. And the consequence of it is that when somebody uses even quite mild language to criticize religion, it's heard as though it was uh, strident and shrill mm -hmm. and, and um, ranting. Right. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I, I've had some experiences in science that that really influenced me as a graduate student. I recall seeing you know, I went I went to a conference and uh, one of the senior scientists there was a was a fellow named Graham Hoyle, who's a well known neuroscientist oh, yeah. at the yes, time. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and I just vividly remember it. In in the middle of one talk, he stood on his chair and he yelled at the speaker to to tell him that this this was all wrong. And, you know, they, they had a good, loud argument. And that argument was one of the most informative things I've run into, yes. is, is, is hearing people argue about things where they don't pull any punches. They say, okay, this is what I believe. The other person says, this is what I believe. This is, this is our differences. They settle the differences. That, that's how you advance. Now, presumably argument. in science, we pay lip service to the idea that if you've got a really vociferous agreement, a disagreement of that sort, it's because all the evidence isn't in. Or, or, or are there other reasons for right. it, do you think? Oh, there's, there's always personality clashes. Yeah. But ultimately, you know, those arguments are always settled by the evidence. That what happens is if if things are fuzzy, if they're ambiguous and they have this this ground that they're arguing over, what they will do is yell at each other for a while and then they'll go to their labs, they'll dispatch the graduate students, get to work and test these interpretations and you'll get an answer out of it. And that's that's the way it should be in anything. Yes. What about semantic arguments, though? What about arguments that don't depend upon evidence, but depend upon words or misunderstandings of words, redefinitions of words, that kind of thing? Oh, yeah, th well, what can we do with those? I mean, all, all we can do, again, is try to be as clear as we can about what we mean. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, one thing that comes to mind, a, a, a subject which in our own field of, of, of biology has been controversial, is, is controversial, is group selection. And uh, my, my feeling about it is that, is that group selection was, was thoroughly destroyed in the 1960s and 70s, but there have been attempts to revive it, which in my view are semantic, because they are, in, they are simply redefining something else, which never used to be called group selection, as group selection, which is right. perfectly respectable, which I would, for example, call kin selection. Yes. Uh, and a, a consequence of that is that um, there's great confusion sown. Yeah, well, you know, on the other hand, though, the, I see some things where there, there are some interesting glimmerings. Now, it, it may be that given time, that, you know, th this is another of those cases where the scientists are all rushing to their labs and doing experiments and doing analyses to see if, if they can resolve the gray area, that, that maybe there will be some phenomena we, we can observe there. Um, you know, for instance, there's, there's a lot of talk right now about evolution of evolvability, for instance, uh, which is obviously, you can't regard that as a, as a, you can't regard that as a property operating at the level of the individual. That's, that's groups with, you know, a, a suite of, of different uh, traits in their, in their population that have an advantage over a different group. Um, 
and and I think it's still an open question whether that's that's a valid way to think about evolution or not. I'm fascinated by it. I yeah. I I've got a theory that I actually coined the phrase evolution of evolvability. It depends when 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 do you think it first appeared? I have no idea. <laughs> um, well, okay, I don't know whether I did or not, but but m my meaning of it is that there are certain I think I would call it embryologies, actually. Certain embryologies which lend themselves to future evolution. Mm -hmm. When, say, the insect body plan was invented, or the mammal body plan, um, maybe those particular examples aren't right, but, but, but when a certain embryological pattern is established, it, it is, some of them are highly evolvable. Yes. The, the, let's, say the, let's say the arthropod body plan with, it, which, with its um, segment, segmentation where you have um, the possibility for segments to differentiate. But it's a, it's a, modular, it's a modular system with, with, with rather like trucks in a train, I mean, going mm -hmm. from front to, to back. And they all have the same structure, but they can be modified in, in all sorts of ways. Um, something like that you could regard as an evolvable embryology, an right. embryology which opens floodgates of possibility for future evolution. And mm -hmm. I can see that that could be thought of as a kind of group selection. Nothing to do with the group selection that Wynne Edwards was talking about, about the yes. evolution of, you know... Um, but, but can you avoid calling it group selection? Because what you're talking about now is that certain clades are going to be selected. Well, I would call it clade, clade selection, uh, okay. which, is, which is actually what George Williams... Uh, George Williams, in his second big book, The, the um, uh -huh. Natural Selection, coined the phrase clade selection, which I think is rather good, actually. I mean, I think um, certain clades are, have what it takes to flower and branch and right. rebranch and adaptively radiate, whereas others don't don't have that 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 quality. Now that is kind of heresy to a to a dyed in the wool neo Darwinian like me. But but nevertheless, <laughs> I think it's I think it is um, plausible and yes. very interesting. Is that what you mean by evolution that's, of evolvability? That's what I mean by evolution of evolvability okay. too. Um, but of course, you can you can have clades at all levels. It doesn't have to be at the phyletic level. It could be you know a particular genus so, has got some advantage yes. over another. And yeah, the, yes. that, that what we see over time is that the lineages that succeed best are those that can leave the most diverse collection of descendants. Yes. Okay. I mean, I think that's fine. I I would hesitate though to call that a Darwinian process. It's it's right. it's a kind of selection, but I think it's probably confusing to even use the same word, natural selection, for it. Because I think it, it's really helpful to use natural selection for selection among individuals uh, within populations, or what perhaps I would say uh, genes within gene pools, which can yes. be made equivalent. Um, and something like clade selection, uh, I think it's very important, but I think it's confusing. It's confusing in the same kind of way. It's, it's confusing of Einstein to use the word God uh, for his kind of uh -huh. pantheistic, um, you know, it, it's, it's, as long as you're bright enough to understand, it's okay, but, but you're likely to mislead people. Right. So, so what term would you use instead of selection? We've got the clade part, but now we need... Well, I don't mind, you, I, okay, <laughs> call, it, call it selection, but, but yeah. Yeah, clade selection, uh, not, not group selection. It isn't group selection, okay. is it? I mean, it's... Um, uh, but wait, why isn't it? What's, what's um, well, group selection in the Win Edwards sense mm -hmm. m meant selection among a sort of meta population of groups within a species right. for group properties such as uh, not overfishing the food supply or um, yeah. not over reproducing or, or, or indeed altruism. Right. Um, and I think that's sufficiently different from clade selection, where you're saying something like the, the whole of the echinoderms yes. has, a, has a certain property, uh, as it were, you know, radial symmetry, which, um, which enabled them to radiate in certain ways.